So let's talk about strength training. And I think the scope of this podcast is going to be to just define it, to give the listeners a good principle to always go back to because the world of fitness and training and everything is the waters are very muddy and it's hard to navigate and i've always believed in educating people to give them the tools to help sift through any instagram post they read any blog post any news article whatever is to better understand if this thing is going to be useful for me so again we are here today with all three coaches myself colin mcgee Coach Gabe Olson and Dr. Tyler Nelson. And so I'm going to throw the first question at Dr. Nelson here is to give us a good definition of strength and strength training that is going to be really useful for the listeners. Um, I would say that strength training is kind of a foundational thing for any athlete and some specific movements. Um, But I think strength training is kind of misguided in the sense that it's not always high enough intensity. And it really depends on the age of the individual that's doing the strength training intervention. But ultimately, to be defined as strength training, it needs to have a couple of primary qualities, one of which is like getting high levels of recruitment, which requires a bit of intensity. And those movements tend to be slow. And so a lot of times when people are trying to get stronger, they're choosing movements that maybe aren't high enough intensity and they're not actually, you know, getting that level of recruitment. Another maybe misguided idea or something we see commonly is that people choose movements that are really have a lot of coordination demand. And when there's a lot of coordination demand, there's less actual strength gains from it. So Ultimately, what athletes want to think about is like, if you're going to strength train, all we really can get, I guess, ensure is going to transfer to rock climbing is the level of recruitment. Because all of these strength training things that we do, they have coordination to them. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to get coordinated at the deadlift because I want to rock climb. I mean, unless people are trying to deadlift, but the goal is to like produce more force in those muscle groups and get that transfer to rock climbing. So another thing is if we're gonna strength train, we have to also spend more time practicing and applying that strength to the climbing wall. As gotcha. well. And that was a bit long, but. <clears throat> no, it's really good. I think the big takeaway points there, right? Intensity, it has to be slow to accumulate that intensity. If there's too much stuff going on, too much coordination demand, we're gonna lose the ability to have that intensity which again is going to define and be that minimum stimulus to actually see strength so that's some big takeaways from that definition there so when it comes to strength training it can exist on and off the wall and again the principles of defining strength training is recruitment intensity making sure things are slow reducing excess movement and the coordination demand to make sure those things are possible what does that kind of look like for an athlete who wants to do strength training on the wall or off the wall what those what do those situations look like and is one better than the other um i think it's the most simple way of thinking about it is it's easier to overload someone off the wall just because on average the average move after move when someone's climbing at their limit is not as much force as they could produce And so by having specific strength training interventions, maybe every day before they climb, or maybe a cycle of it at the beginning of their training block, they have more access to more motor units. Therefore, they have better coordination opportunities in those hard positions. The downside of too much strength training or how people tend to say, I'm just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger, is all of those strength gains have skill, have a skill component, which has a direction, a velocity, a range of motion. And so there's also downsides with too much strength training in the context of if I teach someone to move a particular way and I stay in a modified range of motion only, what I do is I slow my athlete down. I give them less movement options. And that's also not helpful too. So strength training, I think, certainly needs to be a necessary component, but it should be always a small component. But it should always be within those criteria, like we talked about, it's got to be intense, it's got to be slow, it's got to be, and what I'm learning more recently, it's got to have less muscle mass too, because that's also confounding, and we can riff off that, you know, later, but. 
Gotcha. No, okay, that's very useful. Um, <clears throat> and kind of going off that, I think back to other sports, there's always like sports specific training and then there's general strength training. And so takeaways mm -hmm. from that bit a little bit is there is general strength training is useful. But we have to understand that climbing on the wall is the end goal. And I've always used the idea that we're trying to improve the quality of practice. And I got that from, from Tyler. And I use that all the time is strength training is useful. Not that it, on the wall is like the end goal. We have to strength train for a long time for long-term health benefits and whatnot. But the goal is to improve the quality of your practice on the wall at an intensity higher than you would otherwise without strength training. And so climbing is always still the end goal, but we're using strength training uh, to buffer its ability to improve that scenario to get better at climbing. So how would one, and we'll talk about like both of you guys, how would one go about better understanding where they are when it comes to their strength as a climber? How much strength do they need? What direction do they need to go to improve their strength? How does a climber go about understanding what that concept? Gabe, you got any ideas? Strength could just be the simple, like when I'm talking to an athlete who says I'm not strong enough for a move, I guess like that's something that I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's ask them to talk out what they think strength is. Like, can they physically go hold that hold? And like, can they hang on that hold? I think that right there shows they have enough strength to do, to do it. Okay, so maybe they're having a hard time getting to that hold. Do they have a, a enough power to propel themselves to it? Okay, so now that's power. That's that component of, you know, being able to propel themselves to then use the strength that they already know they can hang the hold. But now they have to tie that in with a third component, which would be like coordination and timing, like you're saying. And so I think that is a good way to kind of break down each move is when you're people are saying, I'm not strong enough. It's like, well, can you physically hold it? Can you propel yourself there? Now, can you manage the time frame, or do you have the skill, like you were saying, to use both power and strength to perform that um, is a really good kind of way to get them to talk tangibly about the next steps. Um, there is a fourth component I can kind of touch back and forth on that I do talk about, which is just perception. And I think that is just, do they believe that their current state, that they have the abilities and the attributes to perform what's needed? Because there are plenty of people who are strong enough, but they just don't essentially believe they can do it or that that moves above them. And they don't just know what they're actually paying attention to in the movement. And so that they're like, yeah, I have the physical ability to do something, but I don't have the mental, you know, I'm not mentally prepared to look at how the details and the movement and the timing and like sit in the failure for a little bit and understand it. So that's how I would kind of like coordinate breaking down the use of something. Uh, or like when I say, I, you know, when the, the general question of I'm not strong enough for this. I think there's a lot more there that I like to try to break into as the coach first. Gotcha. No, I mean, I think that's really cool <laughs> as far as climbers ability to assess projects they're on or any type of climbing they're doing is looking at it from that broken down process. Like, can I hold on to it? If I can, yes. If I can't, no. Can I get to it? Can I get off of it? And then utilizing that little algorithm, so to speak, of ways to analyze the climb you're on or the climbing you do is going to help push you in a direction of whether or not strength should be in your future, power should be in your future, coordination, skill, flexibility. And that might bring us into <clears throat> objective versus subjective strength training, right? Um, especially in the climbing world, I always hear a lot of like, these areas are powerful climbers. You're, oh, you're such a strong climber, but it doesn't always have to speak directly back to strength principally. Again, reiterating that strength principally is high recruitment, high intensity, slow, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so a more objective way of assessing strength, at least the components of it, is this camp four performance assessment that we've been you know, utilizing for a very long time. And I love to see the evolution of what it's been doing too. Um, so Tyler, can you speak a little bit more on, even going back to like 
what got you psyched on assessing the components of strength for rock climbing and how it's kind of evolved and, and your thoughts there of how we can build a more objective assessment plan to then speak to more of that really awesome algorithm to analyze climbing that, that Gabe just spoke about. Yeah, one thing that I was thinking of with Gabe too, with the perception, I think that I want to add on is people for sure limit themselves too quickly thinking they're not strong enough for movements, but every single climbing move has a strength component, but it has a skill component. And if it's really close to a grade that you've climbed before, it's really likely that you have the strength to do that move. It's just like you haven't fine-tuned the practice. Totally. You know, but another easier way to think about like developing skills, if athletes are strong already, it's easier to learn those skills, but they have to get out of the perception that it's more strength. They just need to practice the skills more. Like for me, I've been learning to skateboard. People have been following my account and I've been able to progress really fast because I have a big training background and I'm pretty strong. But at the beginning, I got tired a little bit in my legs, but after a couple of weeks, like that went away and then it's all about skills practice, right? But if I was someone that had very little strength, it would be much harder to trust my body and doing those big high velocity drop-in kinds of things, you know? So it's like, I think I like the idea of, supporting and suggesting strength training for athletes primarily because it's easier to learn skills you know because of that but say on that i always think it's kind of funny when people are moving up that next grade it's kind of like they're racking another weight like a full plate on a bar yeah, yeah. That they're like oh in order for me to climb v10 i have to add a full another plate on both sides and it's like no it's not like more strength isn't required like the force you're using isn't higher suddenly it's the skill might be like the move the movement might be slightly more complex but like not the amount of force being produced you know it's yeah, so, very so. subtle very or, subtle. or, or, or <laughs> i think you mentioned it not that long ago that it's kind of laughing about because like you know the amount of coordination it takes to do a one-arm pain although it looks not like very complex it doesn't look like there's a lot of coordination happening it's it's really hard to do a one-armed contract in that time frame yeah. reduce that to have those stabilizers like there's a tremendous amount of coordination happening that i think people want to look over because there's nothing showy looking you know right. like we can do a flip and you see that it takes coordination one arm pain doesn't seem complex enough for people to think it's about coordination for sure so is using a fingerboard there's a big coordination component with a fingerboard i was asking allison when she was in recently um with palmer and they were testing and i was asking her about the one-arm hang and her method and her technique for doing the one-arm hang is so specific if it's anything different than that she can't do the same amount of weight hmm. and so it's really like a, a wingspan it's like hanging with one arm other arm straight fully reaching out your wingspan to do the hang or it can't be done at the highest intensity so there's absolutely skill components with that but when it comes to like the testing stuff i usually you know, use the testing to tell people that they're strong enough to do things and practice more. And that's kind of been my experience with myself and just to overall do less stuff because doing less stuff. And that's another, I think, component of perception where you say the perception of the person, what they're thinking, but also their ability to actually get lots of recruitment is a function of how hard it feels based on the complexity of the movement, but also their fatigue from previous sessions. So totally. I think the reason I got into it was just from other sports doing, you know, working at like a division one level program with like the university of Missouri, they got all the toys and all the fun stuff and climbers have very little of those things. And so it's just a very obvious need. And in, in our sport is to answer your question, essentially how I we went down that rabbit hole. <laughs> no, that was beautiful i loved it <laughs> there was so much there um yeah so the assessment kind of brings a, a modern perspective on the strength and conditioning world that has existed but now we're kind of bringing it to the rock climbing world to just help answer those questions and i was talking to allison two uh two weeks ago or something when we were in philly and she brought that up she said one of the coolest things about tyler's assessments is he just confirmed that like i'm okay like I'm good enough. And then I can just kind of trust myself that the reason I can do this or I can't do that is just genetic. It's just who I am. And that's okay to be who you are. Rock those things. And I was like, that's so cool. Right. And so the strength training isn't always answering 
how strong you are, even though that was another comment of hers. She's just like, I like to go for the ego boost. I'm just like, I'm the strongest. Sure. And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Like, nothing. Oh, every time yeah. she comes in, she's like, I have to beat 205. I'm like, <laughs> which yeah. I'm like, cool, you go for it. Like, I'll, I want to see it too. I'm psyched as well. Right. I want to find any top athlete that doesn't have an ego. Like, that's so important. Like, people yeah, yeah, always, like is. hate on <laughs> ego, and it's like, absolutely not. Like, ego is super important for you. And like, here's good ego and bad ego, but like ego is important and and again I, you know it goes to show right there like when we're kind of talking about perception but like the the weight of your you just approving that her body is normal essentially and like or like and like what she can do is just giving her an okay is like that's that's a huge amount for an athlete just to have somebody else no matter who they are and what ability they are just to have somebody else from the outside say no you're like you're good like that's enough like you, like your body doesn't need to suddenly change in order for you to do this next thing. Like, so I think coaches, you know, that's one of the pros and cons of, of our job is that well, not necessarily a con, but we do carry a lot of weight in our word when we are assessing somebody. Like, I mean, the amount of athletes who I think have got hurt, bummed on themselves when they come in for a retest and they're one pound less, you know, on a assessment and they're like, Oh my God, I'm weaker. And it's like, no, you're absolutely not. Like, it was one, one pound, like that was an attempt, you know, like, so I think just like the metrics are both fun and scary and like us assessing them, assessing somebody is, or evaluating them isn't always, you know, the asking for more out of them. It's saying mm -hmm. that they're, you're, you're, you're great with what you have. Like now <laughs> go enjoy your sport, like go climb, go do what you want to do. Pulling on an edge isn't that fun. Like that's not your sport like climbing is right so, that, that's all yeah because i would say i think in a post i did or about to do today um that assessment is all about the clarifying the direction you need to go it's not about finding your training loads all the time it's not about telling you you're weak or strong but it's the direction you need to go so after the assessment we just might tell you all right you just need to work on footwork like that's the goal of the assessment is clarifying your direction. So if you haven't been assessed by someone, not saying that you absolutely have to have a rock climber, oh. you can just go out and have fun and do what you need to do. But when it comes to like optimizing the time it takes to for you to end that journey or any of your goals, assessment is really useful, especially from you know a professional that knows a little bit what to do, but also how to communicate the assessment results. Um, yeah. Well, the cool thing about it is it can be whatever. <clears throat> we want it to be and the part that I like about it it's always changing like kind of surprised that I didn't really kind of pinpoint the importance of the difference between pulling and isolating the finger flexors and how that has implications for the training loads that people do you know because that's pretty mind-blowing in terms of how people train their fingers for climbing and you know now I spend majority of my time talking to people with finger injuries and they're all doing the same things. And those have got to be a part of the reason why people are getting sore. Because if we're loading with 50% more load on a fingerboard than we ever will have access to on the climbing wall, that makes no sense. That's a bad mm. training application, yep. you know? And so to be able to have more people test that, I think will be really like important and, and validate that a little bit more. But maybe one other thing we can talk, I think we should talk about, we'll definitely have a power um podcast as well but another thing when just with allison is we retested her you know because one of her interventions was like the campus sporting like most people do and i gave her some other ideas and she's been using these other ideas which actually have more velocity and so we retested her velocity it was way strong it was way better way faster it was amazing and she was so psyched and so the testing for sure is like it needs to be for an individual but it's not really designed to compare people and that's i think a really bad application of testing because I don't really, you know, I care what other people do just because I'm interested, but that it's not an apples to apples comparison because our mechanics are also different. And so it's not really in all the cases that helpful for people to compare themselves to some sort of standard data set. Yep. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. You keep hearing about all these, you know, other companies out there that have these massive databases of climbers <laughs> and they're like, you know, take this take this huge test or assessment and we're going to tell you where you rank and where the, where the, like where you fall in, in your grade. And I like, that's never sat well with me because I think if you see the top athletes or you see beginners, you know, who are getting into it, like it, the metrics still just don't make sense. Like you can, you're going to find trends, like 
you find with any sport, like your, your gold medalist in any sport is probably not physically that different than your last place Olympian, you know, like they're all genetic freaks. They've got to that point, uh, you know, in their field that I think if we're just ranking everyone that they have to have this, like the standard and like, as somebody who has really weak fingers, you know, or something like that, or like long fingers, like my just fingers look different, you know, compared to like all these, my friends who we were just looking at his hands, like they just look like massive, like sausages. They look <laughs> just robust because they are huge. And so, but like, I guess it's kind of interesting to compare what we can do on hold and like our grades are, you know, quite a bit different, but like, I would say his hand looks stronger and can do more, but I have different technical skills than he doesn't. So it's like, you know, what does, what do the assessments always mean for you are interesting in like ranking ourselves based on those metrics, I think is a pretty bad trend that we have going, but um, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, it's interesting to see how much weight we put in our ranking to everyone else um, instead of just our own climbing. Like I think my, the people who have had the best successes from program to program and assessments have really just looked at themselves improving mm. and not like, I don't think anyone has got better numbers and metrics because I've told them how much better somebody else is than theirs, you know, like, and so I think that's always kind of important, like, because I think anytime they aren't feeling like they're, it meets their time frame to match somebody else's performance, it actually just holds them back. And so, but if they're just beating them kind of like chasing their own improvement, I've seen way more success. Right. So. Another little cool mini example, I was talking to Olaf when he posted about Stefano's results and he really wanted to share those results because someone who can climb 515 plus, like the results weren't as impressive as probably the general population is imagining. Like everyone imagines like oh, totally. Usain Bolt does 90 hours of training or LeBron James only walks around in things that make his calves amazing to jump 50 inches. <laughs> and like the realization is like, it's not that crazy. Like they're impressive and they work their asses off for that stuff, but it's not this super human, like 7.5 strength to weight ratio and their pinky to low kind of stuff that just, that can't yeah. really happen. Um, and that the send getting from the bottom to the top is always going to be so much, so much more than uh, your strength to weight ratio or your numbers or anything like that. But to reiterate, because <clears throat> we went on a lot of awesome circles <laughs> there, <laughs> um, assessment and knowing how strong you are is again, important to clarify the direction of your training for a little bit. Let's talk about after I get assessment, right? So we talked about clarifying the direction. So what might be some indications maybe besides what Gabe talked about on his like on the wall algorithm that tells someone, hey, we might need to get uh, a little bit more strength training into your program. Yeah, I would say like a maybe a really easy way to think about it would be for people that are new to a sport. It depends on where they come from. Like I came into climbing with quite a bit of strength already from other sports. And so strength was never a problem of mine, but I always had this emphasis of being stronger from these other sports. And so I would say for my development as a climber, it inhibited it, inhibited it a little bit because I would overly rely on my pole strength. And that's a function of my training history and my leverage and my genetics. So I would say for people that don't come from a sporting background in general and they want to start climbing as an adult, they definitely need to do some basic, you know, the typical full range of motion, heavy, slow loading, strength training, maybe with four primary movements, and they're going to see a huge improvement on the wall. For someone that has a really advanced training age, doing those full range of motion movements are likely a waste of their time because they probably have very high levels of recruitment anyways. And to get higher levels of recruitment, they need to be very specific with the ranges of motion, the types of muscle contractions, and get away from those big power or big typical body, um, you know, like bench pressing, deadlifting, pull-ups, et cetera. Those are giving them significantly less returns, but they're fatiguing and they're costing them time and energy. And so I would say it really depends more on someone's training history. I think with the assessment, I usually 
I don't use the assessments really to give someone or to give me information on saying you probably need more or less of this. In some cases, the training history, they'll tell you, people will tell you, people know what they have done and what they need more or less. And then we can use the numbers to either, you know, track an adaptation that we're trying to look for or send them in the direction of you got plenty of strength, you need to move faster or you got plenty of speed, you need to increase your overall recruitment levels. And so I would say the training history is way more important than someone's physical assessment on what they really need. Gotcha. Totally. Yeah, cool. I, I, I'd say that it's kind of funny, or, or I guess like to go off that. Um, I think just asking an athlete, you know, when they're talking about are they strong enough, it's like getting them to just phrase out like, are you strong enough for your for your goals, like your current goals? And I think that's like a way better thing because it's really easy to always look towards the end. Go, you know, so if I say I want to climb B14, I mean, if I make, you know, the end of my goal, the only goal, that's kind of going to be a bad process of getting there is because like the strength I need at B14 like that's a far, like that's a long time away because I'm currently not climbing B14. So I obviously need strength and skills and a process now that I don't have to get there. And so I think just asking somebody like, are you strong enough for your current goals? Their response should really just be yes or no. And it doesn't need to be that much more until that question's answered yes or no and then the next question of okay what do we need to do next and so tracking that adaptation like you're saying is great like that's where we can use the assessments is okay you've now defined where you want to go next or that you you do or don't have this now we can kind of progress because there's probably 99 smaller goals that we're going to achieve along the way before that v14 goal and so i think like the little successes are definitely or in little goals uh are kind of glossed over because they don't carry the weight mm -hmm. that that end goal had yeah totally agree oh i like that that's uh that's good and i think we have a few minutes left here to wrap this up as we always we promise nice short sweet uh sometimes to the point conversations about this but i think what this episode really highlighted was a nice reflection on the conversation that you can a have with yourself and you built in little algorithms to approach a climb you've had or a project or better of a conversation with a professional about assessment or how to understand who you are, are you strong enough and what you need to do. And again, clarifying the direction of your journey is what it's all about. Not everyone needs to go pull on a block and see how strong their fingers are. No one has to get super obsessed about optimizing your thing, but this conversation is about if you have goals and you want to go along a journey and save some time along the way, working with a professional or having these little algorithms in your back pocket is a really useful thing to help clarify what you need to do. How strong is strong enough? I don't know. We don't know you. We don't know your goals. Have a conversation using these <laughs> tools, A, with yourself or B, with a professional like one of us, and we can help you clarify your way to meeting the climbing goals, strength goals, or whatever it is that you want to. Um, strength training needs to be intense. It needs to be slow. It needs to reduce the amount of excess movement or coordination needs so you can achieve the intensities and speeds. So strength training will always have a principle definition that we need to understand and follow. That way we know we are strength training and not doing anything else. And in future podcasts, we can really dive into the components of strength training when it comes to the anatomy and the tissues and everything that contributes to it. But take that principle definition along with you so that you can clear yourself through some muddy waters, but also realize that you don't have to be as strong as the person next to you to have a good time on the wall or to achieve your goals. Yeah, no, I think that's great summary. I would say like people shouldn't expect their strength training routines. That includes finger training to like transfer and make them climb harder. That's not very realistic. And that's, you know, because all of the strength training interventions that we do, even if we try and be as what people like to say specific as possible, it's still not the same skill. And so in order to get some sort of transfer from your strength training intervention, again, it needs to be all of the things you mentioned, but it needs to be pretty low volume 
so it's easy to recover from and as well as your climbing session so you can get that high quality practice every time you go to the gym then you're going to get some sort of transfer from your strength training but if you sprinkle on strength training on top of your high volume training already you're not going to see the benefits of strength training and therefore think it's not necessary and so it's really about you know obviously doing it is helpful but it's really about how you mix it into your normal climbing life because most people don't get that right and then they don't see the benefits of strength training which is very common Mm, that's a good one too the miscommunication of what strength training is actually going to do for us does not immediately make you a good climber no it will not increase your climbing grade yep only practicing the sport will increase your climbing grade at a high frequency as well but high frequency not high volume like Mm -hmm. trying to have longer sessions is not the answer to climbing a harder grade it has to be a very high intensity session but it needs to be easy to recover from and you got to do it a lot Mm -hmm. yeah it's good I, Gabe, I final feel thoughts? like my brain just like is like running with a million different <laughs> ideas and or in the sense of like phrasing but I think one of the largest like takeaways from this conversation and or not like or just really making me want to articulate it I guess is like almost all of this keeps coming down to like time frame management and understanding like the process of how long like we know that muscles and tendons take different time frames to get bigger and stronger and we know like it's skill time you know takes you have to put in the time to get better at it and so when we we're talking about you know uh, the intensity and or first like the volume of it or the time frame like there are a, like it's easy to find the destination there's a lot of different paths there and so now it's managed the time frame to get to that goal and that 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 destination um and so I think, you know, again, it's easy to, to forget about how quick a, like a skill and mental game that can adapt within the session that can carry on from all your careers. Like you probably aren't going to adapt your muscles and your tendons in a session. And so I think like sometimes like your strength gains are often get confused with like your performance goals. And I think those are different time frames. Is that you can get better performance in a very short time frame through skills and, and mental game than you probably can get strength adaptation. Mm-hmm. And I, I think trying not to confuse performance and strength, uh, because those are what we're saying don't go hand in hand. Like yep. you can be stronger and not perform better. You can yep. definitely perform better and not be stronger. Um, I think that you know. That, and I think it comes back to time management. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we're Absolutely. putting in the work. Yep. Clarifying the direction. That's basically what this episode has talked about. If you can do that, you can save time. You can do exactly what you need to do within your practical day uh, and not worry about what everyone else is doing because that doesn't matter. I'm actually, right, pleased. I'm actually pretty pleased that I said zero swear words during this part. <laughs> yeah, I think I said ass with some one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in today, for listening, and for your continued support to Camp 4 Human Performance. We really love what we do, and we love bringing everyone the most up-to-date information to keep everyone as healthy as they can, climbing as hard as they can, or as long as you guys want your climbing careers. We have some exciting things coming up, like I mentioned in the intro with our sponsors, so look forward to some giveaways, some awesome collaborations, and you can always feel free to reach out to us on Instagram. Mine is at McGee. Dr. Tyler Nelson is at C4HP, and Gabe Olson is going to be at Technically Strong. Feel free to reach out to us there or on the website through our emails. And we've got a ton of content on the website and always looking forward to helping you one-on-one or through other educational sources like our online recorded content and our in-person things, which we're starting to build a calendar for 2023. But Tyler will be out in Maine, September 23rd and 24th. And I will be at Cornell University teaching a clinic as well, September 24th and 25th. That one has some discounts to the students and the staff, but the public is also going to be uh, allowed to join that as well. So stay tuned for those details. That will be launching pretty soon. Thank you again. Please 
like this, support this, share this, and leave us questions and comments so we know how to build this podcast around you because you are the most important thing that we care about. Thank you all again. See you next time.